In the email that Ronnie sent out, I uh, did mention some of the topics we could possibly talk about today. <laughs> uh, one being any research that anybody's doing, or possibly posts that are being put on the Facebook page. And I thought at the end of the meeting we could possibly say a few words about our FIPO relative. Yeah, why not? The other railway, <laughs> the Sumatra one, is suddenly, suddenly mm. attracting a lot of interest. Mm. I know partly why, um, but no, this was um, one of the guys that was involved with the memorial at the Arboretum was a guy called Jeff Lee, or <clears> give him <throat> his full proper name, John Jeff Lee. So you can imagine the fun I had trying to trace his POW card about 20 years ago. Um, and he evidently kept a diary. And the ship he was on, we believe that was taken to Sumatra, because his daughter's writing the story, was sunk. <coughs> now, we look at his questionnaire, and he gives dates when he left Singapore and when he arrived in Sumatra. Yeah, fine, okay, great, marvellous. Problem is we can't find a ship that sailed. And the ship he mentions has got no record of sailing in August. So you think that, so they're, they're actually trying to sort it out now. It's lots of people who came in. You've got Jamie Farrell um, uh, has uh, con contributed law ridings again from the Java Club. She's contributed, but it's all still around late July. There's nothing in August. <laughs> And it started off as a Queen Elizabeth ferry, then it was a Queen Elizabeth II ferry, and now we're up to Queen Elizabeth III ferry. So, you know, it's interesting. But it's, it's suddenly you've got, you've got that interest now um, coming up again. Yes, Keith, you did mention that you had a map of the Sumatra Railways at the Arboretum. Oh, gosh. The one I've seen now is in Lizzie Oliver's book. So I actually got hold of that one. I haven't got hold of the original Dutch book, basically because the price is up in the 60 or 70 pound mark. But I would think I might well sort of give in to temptation and buy it. Um, and the other one, the map I've seen of the railway, was in a booklet that was produced by actually Jack Plant, whose first name was John. Um, and uh, Jeff Lee, when the memorial was dedicated at the Arboretum. And I believe that is in the Kofipo archives because I left it up there. I did a copy of it for um, Jamie Farrell and his daughter when they were over for the last conference. Um, so I've got to go digging that out. But the one in Lizzie Oliver's book is very good. Breaks it down camp by camp. Oh, it's got as good as Lizzie Oliver's book, Keith. Hmm? I was going to suggest Lizzie Oliver's books, Keith. They're uh, very yeah. informative. Also, yeah, her very, website. Very Right. And they answer emails, Keith. Sorry? And they answer emails. Any queries that you've got, they'll come back to you quite oh, quickly. Right. Okay. With those. That's worth it. Yeah, I'll have, I'll have to have a look. I'm sure it's probably one of the book. Yeah, I'll let you know when I can get back in there. <laughs> so I've got to be there, I've got to be there Saturday. But Saturday afternoon, I've been told to be here because there's a street end of a drive VJ party going on. So it's going to be, uh, that will get a chance to look in the building. Yes, Martin. Keith, would it be worth talking to Rob Beatty? Because I know he's got information on the Sumatran Railway as well from when I was out there. Yeah, yeah, I could have a word with Rod. He, he tends not to answer emails. I don't know what, well, he doesn't answer my emails anyway. But I'd <laughs> imagine he's too busy with lots of bits and pieces because he's got yeah, two grown-up daughters now and he's trying to set up a business in australia so <coughs> yeah good morning mr farrar you're very quiet late guys. yes how are you i was well. uh, i was rung at 10 01 or 10 mm -hmm. by a certain leslie clark who sends her best wishes on oh leslie yes brilliant should see her next week i think as well but no she's not going to the arboretum oh i think so i thought she was no, um, oh. she's, uh, she's got things on down in Essex, you know, oh, Essex, right, yeah. that, that sticks out in the water by London. 
so um, <laughs> she's she won't be up unfortunately oh, so sure. i can tell you one thing though keith there are at least two of us on this picture that will be there Go on, then. Three of us. and yeah. thomas Bob, barbara's there yeah, because Barbara's there, I'm not surely. in the I'm not in the posh bubble like you lot are. I'm just in the posh. I'm just the common <laughs> one who'll be watching the big screen, even though I have my wreath up there. He may come home with me. Never mind. But, but, <laughs> he'll get, what he'll area, get there what one way. Are you in, yeah, I'm going to throw this over the the thing, you know. Say, yeah, somebody put this for me. <laughs> I've got in, in with all that stuff that I what, received what, for the day. What seat are you in, Barbara? Sorry, what what seat? What no, seat are I'm, you I'm in? not. Yeah. Um, I'm just watching the big screen, which is a bit sad. But there you go. But I've got pictures from the last the last one, VJ seventy. Yeah, I know people have been coming back and saying, "Oh, I'm in I'm in Bloom Four or Green Five, whatever." Yeah, now I've got nothing. Um, but I'm still waiting for my ticket to come through. I've I've, you know, applied on the fourth, and I'm assuming I will get a ticket either in the post or by email. Well, I got a bit misled by Read Leslie, email, I must Keith. say, because Leslie said, you're on the list. So and I so. thought that meant I was OK. Um, so when, yeah. <clears throat> when I was talking to Martin a, a couple of weeks ago, and uh, Martin sort of said that he, he'd heard he was going to be in. So I contacted Leslie and she said, oh, I think I used the wrong you know, thing, mm. which is just unfortunate. It was just I wasn't on the list. I was on a list that she would have said I, I should have been, you know, I, I'm not bothered, you know, in that respect. I'm no, not I've, I've, I've applied, Tom, I, I, let's put it this way, I've, I've registered, Barbara, I've got all my details in the car details, the RBL, but I've heard nothing else yeah. at the moment. Barbara, is it not worth you ringing the RBL tomorrow and saying, look, I might been... try, I might, you know, we'll they see, really, we'll see what happens. I will say, actually, their contact centre was very helpful, and the young lady that I've been dealing with, again has been very very helpful right well when you say the contact center do you mean the one at the nma or the actual um british legion british legion the london london branch well it, the, it, the it's a london branch but they answer it in bristol okay well i'm a, I'm a, a british legion member as well which is a bit galling isn't it but well you'll find out i mean we've got two tickets issued to go fipo i was asked to go on one uh, and the chairman was asked to go on another, which he accepted, um, yeah. and said, oh, I'm bringing my partner along. And they said, no, only no. two tickets. Sorry. That's fair. Like I said, I I've, I've, I've filled in the registration form, Tom, sent it back to the RBO on the 4th of August. There is nothing so far. Yeah. I mean, Chris Wills said she was, you know, she was, um, she would try for me and she let me know that, no, it was, as you said, only two tickets. Um, one for yourself and one for David. So, you know, mm. I shall be there in in spirit. Yeah. You can all wave to me. Well, hopefully I will. But if I don't get a ticket, I don't want. No. Well, it's one of those things, isn't it? But there we go. Well, I did email them yesterday, and to the person that sent me the original email, I said, "Look, I filled in all my forms on the fourth of August. Send them back to you. Um, do I get an email confirming?" that I can, I'm still invited or I can get in or whatever. And mm. I'll wait and see what that gets replied to tomorrow. Yeah. Oh, well, <laughs> I'm sure you have to be vetted as well in case you're planning on assassinating no, no. one of them, you know, but there you go. Barbara, I would, yeah. I would, I would ring them tomorrow and at least start the ball rolling. No, Nothing I can't okay. be helping, Barbara, because there won't be a massive. Sorry, so, Tom? The cat, the, the cat have done a terrorist watch. <laughs> yeah, I haven't ruled you out then, Tom. They can't have done the terrorist watch, Barbara. Let me end yeah. up We'll see. Anyway, I've got a you know place in the car park at ten o'clock. But thinking about it, actually, the program starts at half past nine. So no, you arrive people... at half past. You arrive at half past nine, or oh, that's when you're going right. to arrive. No, I'm I can assure you, if, if I'm right going, I'll be there a lot earlier than half past nine. So it's going yeah. to be crowded whether they'd let me in before then because i want to try if i can't get in to lay the wreath i want to be able to watch it on the big screen um you know it's it's difficult isn't it but no it's it, what will be will be 
um, mm -hmm. and so long there's a representatives there who say it isn't just the forgotten army because this is the strange thing I found when I first started researching my dad I thought my dad was part of the forgotten army and everybody with FIPO links tend to say they're members of the forgotten army but you know correct me if I'm wrong the forgotten army are not the prisoners the forgotten army are the ones that were still fighting the 14th, the 14th army that's it and um, all the chin dits, all that sort of thing and now this focus of this thing for VJ75 is concentrating thanks to Captain Tom on the forgotten army and what I've now become forgotten are the FIPOs in many ways um, and I'm hoping that you can all be there if you're there in that bubble and we'll say a bit and say, you know, this is our hut. Go in and oh, see yeah. it and, yeah, and they, be horrified. Yeah, they, they know about it. They're, I think from what I understand, there's going to be a couple of FIPOs there and yeah. a civilian internee, from what I've been told. Do you know who they are? Is it our, our new for one of my research in FIPO history? I think, the, uh, I think the civilian internee is Olga Henderson. Yeah, I thought it would be Olga, yeah. Yeah. Keith, what time are you intending to get there then, if you're going? Um, if I can, I'm going to try, well, I'll probably leave home here about 8 o'clock, so I'm probably about quarter to 9, 9 o'clock. Yeah, that's what I was aiming for, to be honest with you. So I haven't got a voucher for parking, I've only got a ticket for entrance, so hopefully that'll do. Well, I would I would think that will do it, to be perfectly honest. That's the same they, took, they took all my car registration that's details. The, 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 they'll stop people coming into the car park. Right. By the sounds of our joining instructions, Martin, they stop people coming in through the car park. Say that again, you're breaking Hello. badly. By the way it reads on the, the way it reads the way the joining instructions read is that they the, the the gate that you've got to get through will be at the car park entrance. Right. Because the, uh, they'll be turning people away from there. Yeah. The car park's on the other side of the road as well, so that'll be an interesting yeah, that's probably the one they use. Yeah. That, that's, the, that's the overflow car park, Martin. Yeah. That's the yeah. car park they're using as the overflow. Fair enough. Mm. Well, we'll see when we get there anyway. Yeah. So, can I, I just ask? I, 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 George has said to me, oh, there's going to be something on. Dan Snow is going to do this, that and the other. So I sat down and, and waited, and, and my disappointment, I mean, the chap that they interviewed was lovely, um, but, you know, there was nothing. So I've watched every morning in the hope that they're going to move through history and, and come on to the FIPOs and internees under a musher, and there's nothing so far. Um, when I was um, the second BBC person that um, interviewed me, she was just amazed at some of the things I told her. So at the bottom of it, because I had to email her again, and, and I put about my dad, and she emailed me back, having spent half an hour talking to me, and she said, could you tell me who it is that, that um, has got that relative that was a FIPO? And I went, you know, well, that was me. I've been talking to you for half an hour. You hadn't even realised, you know, that I was the daughter of a FIPO, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, all she wanted to know was about Commonwealth um, troops and things like that. Um, and then I told her about, uh, it, it came to my mind what you'd said um, to me, Keith, that we'd been talking a few days before. And I said, oh, of course, the royal link is um, Prince Philip. And I could remember it came to my mind, which is unusual at my age. And I said he was on HMS Welp. Um, you know, oh, was he? Goodness me, we didn't know oh, that. God, you what? Know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, was he? Was he there? You know. So I was really glad we'd had that conversation, um, Keith, because it actually stayed in my mind it was the whelp that it was on. Mm. Uh, you know, and they did not seem to have much idea. Um, I sent her a picture of the, um, the metal um, thing that commemorates the West African troops so that hopefully they can go and find that. That's not mm. far from where the railway tracks are um, and put her, you know, into things like that. But the, I mean, she did admit to me that she'd been thrown in at the deep end. Oh, she'd yeah. been given four weeks to do it all for the live program. The other lady that I'd spoken to, um, she was the one who was doing research towards the program that has been pre-recorded for the evening. Um, and you know, she was lovely. In fact, um, Thursday or Friday, she sent me a most beautiful, which I'm sure was sent to everybody she's spoken to. 
email thanking me for my contribution for her, which I thought was very nice of her. I didn't expect that. Um, but I just, the more I witness going on, they really have no idea. Thank goodness they are now putting that it is it marks the end of the Second World War, which they've never said much about before, have they? Yeah. But there you go. We do have it. <laughs> yep. Did you um, just did you get a ticket, Martin, or was it um, an actual email? It was an email like that. Well, yeah. Yeah, I got the original email, and I re and I registered. So I don't know whether this I need you to come back. Now this came Is back yesterday. Oh, right. Sorry, sir. Is Karen able to go in with you? Well, if she didn't, uh, let's put it this way, I'd be worried about falling over with the way I am. Yeah, okay. I was going to say, if she wasn't, but she was going to be there, I mean, she's more than welcome to come round with George and I while we watch the, the thing sooner than her being on their own, her own. That was all. No, she, she'll, she's, well, she'd have Tom as well to look after us, but it's, with, with the way I am, I've just got to be a little bit careful, mm -hmm. unfortunately. So... Now that I will say that the young lady that I've been talking to, Sherry, has been absolutely superb. You know, well, we can't have you falling over and we need an ambulance. So, yes, your missus better be there to make sure somebody can pick you up and throw you out the way. You know, <laughs> all, all joking apart, she's, they have, she's actually gone out of her way to help me. Yes. So, to say something? Hi. Can I just say something? Yeah, please do. Yeah. yeah. Um, I've uh, why I'm late coming on is I've been trying to get on. I came onto this com uh, computer. I'm in full silence, quite hot here. So I've got my laptop, <laughs> and I can do blue jeans and I can do Zoom, but I can't do um, this room, this messenger room, because it only does on go uh, Google Chrome. And yeah. Google Chrome will not load down on. I've tried numerous times to get onto my laptop, which is an Apple um, um, uh, uh, Pro Book um, thing. Yeah. And it will not work. It will not. Well, down. It comes down, it just shows, and then it just disappears. No, <laughs> so maybe, on, Apple. maybe that's why we've lost some people because maybe they can't get onto Google Chrome. Possibly, but I'm, I've got an Apple machine. Yeah. I load it onto um, that because mine's Apple and I've got got Chrome on it. Yeah, I think I we've got, here we're going, through, we're going through Messenger here anyway, so it should I've, be. I've downloaded it numerous times. I've downloaded numerous times, and the little um, symbol looks there, and it bounces and disappears completely, and it's still. <laughs> I I don't know what's wrong. I've even looked on the um, web pages in YouTube how to get it on there. Won't do. So I'm now sitting for the sun, but I'm here anyway. I'm sorry I'm late. No, it's all right. I just downloaded it. Yeah, just download, same as I did. Yeah, just sure download it. Download, copy and paste the uh, the link. Yeah, that's yeah. what I did. Yeah. I did, yeah, I did that. Did everything. Did everything. Yeah. It seems very and, strange. Uh, Apple um, Mac um, Pro. MacBook, MacBook Pro. Yeah. Have you got what? Um, browser have you got is your browser safari i've got safari and i've got um firefox um mozilla i uh, wonder whether it's firefox blocking it yeah. blocking it yeah yeah i downloaded firefox because it wouldn't work on chrome uh, oh safari. right okay work on safari. so you 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 got on you no, it won't work on safari but if you downloaded firefox and it works you don't need chrome <laughs> if, you, if, it, if it works on safari uh, yeah, on um, Firefox, which I think it will do, because it's a similar thing to um, Google Chrome. They work in competition with each other. Well, I, I tried to come up, and I'm really annoyed about that. <laughs> you? Are you, are you still I'll, I'll interrupt your, the, the conversation and the flow of things. Well, you got in via Firefox, so that's good. Yeah. Okay. Carry on. <laughs> Well, let's put it this way. We have a, um, a COFIPO trustees meeting every quarter and I go in through Gmail and I'll be honest, the, the sound quality is rubbish. 
Now, I don't know if it's because people are going in through different servers and not going through um, Google. I don't know, but terrible. I mean, this is brilliant. This is far better than Blue Jeans was. Yes, a lot better. Yeah, and we were paying for Blue Jeans. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it was. Well, I, I don't actually think it. Mm. I don't actually think it's. Go on, Tim. He's. I think he's muted himself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It sounds off, Tim. We've lost. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> also, Martin, he, your your picture's frozen. I don't know if you know that. What mine? Mine. No, no. Oh, Martin, not, um, yeah, my, it, mine actually did this last time I came on, and I actually had to close out of it and reopen it. So I might I might just try that, see if that works. Don't forget you could be the new regulations the out there on the virus. They don't allow the signals over the border. Put you in quarantine, Martin. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, that's right. I have, have to spend two weeks in a hotel. <laughs> there is a, there's a, another one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you've you've actually got the font of, font of all knowledge on here for X, yeah. and he's uh, he's sitting there with his a smile and his Captain Pugwash beard on. <laughs> and goes any help you wanted to next Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Oh, God. Yeah. Tom and I know each other well enough. He knows I'm only teasing. <laughs> Tom is the one. Yeah, your, your walking stick is going to disappear. <laughs> <laughs> what you mean? You're going to carry Karen for me? Thank you. No, in all seriousness. Um, <laughs> Tom is Tom is a fond for knowledge. When we have no, it, it says it. It says it's on at my end. It is, yeah. Um, yeah. When we had some fun with a local newspaper around here, electronic newspaper, the Stone Gazette, and he was right. saying that the end of the World War Two was VE Day. Mm. Tom wrote a lovely article about what was happening in Japan and what was happening in the Far East, to which the guy turned around basically and said, oh, I didn't know that, and thank you very much. So we did get local publicity. Um, I personally just wish that we could get more, because there's still a lot of people that think VE Day was the end of the war, which obviously yeah. it wasn't. Mm -hmm. But, uh, I mean, Barbara's put a couple of pieces in her... Birmingham FIPO thing, one piece from myself, one from Tom. And we've got to remember that actually the guys in Macassar didn't get released until, or relieved by the Aussies until, was it the 11th of September? Right. So. 23rd September. 23rd, beg your pardon. So, yes, the war carried on for a little bit. Oh, well, but it, it's saying I'm on here all the time, so. <laughs> yeah, I suppose, you know, the castle was one that... I was going to say, go on, go on, Keith, you've got something about Macassar. No, I was going to say Macassar, I suppose, is one of these terrible island camps that hardly anybody knew about it was a secret camp i mean you think you said 23rd of september that's over a month yeah since the end of the since the ceasefire yeah, well, i weeks. must admit i didn't know it was i didn't know that's so a thank you i've learned something today but i know you know when people talk about no, right you know, about the thai burma railway i don't know what it is, then, because it is. um and then you think well what about the camps on Macassar? what about the camps of ambon well, you could do actually, you really know? Do you, you could, really know? You could actually say that the guys on the Thai Burma Railway had an easy time of it compared, and if, compared, that, if yeah. they had an easy time, you get an idea of how bad it was on some of these other camps. Mm. Yeah. So, go on, Tom. Use your knowledge. Share your knowledge. Well, Makassar, uh, they stopped work. Uh, on the 
15th of, of August when the BJ Day happened, when, when the surrender was accepted. But they, it was 23rd before the Australian forces came to accept the surrender of Makassar. In the meantime, the camp had been in touch with the Australian forces at Balikpapan, which is over on Borneo, and they managed to send out uh, supplies and some advanced troops to make sure that everything was um, okay for for the the FIPOs that were still there. But it was, like we said, it was the 23rd of September before the. Um, the island was officially handed over to the Australians. Now, um, the Admiralty worked out worked very quickly and got the HMS Maidstone, uh, which you may remember was a prison ship in the Northern Ireland Troubles in the 70s. Um, she diverted to Makassar to pick them up and bring them home. So they didn't get home until the 11th of December. So, you know, all the, the lads on the railway were home and the lads that came through Singapore were home on the and the passenger ships and the, and the troop ships that brought them home they all arrived home October November time but uh, it was the castle lads that was back it um, like I said 11th December before they got home mm -hmm. and by that time of course there was nobody left to do any celebrating when they arrived just arrived to an empty dock on, on an empty berth on, on the dock in Portsmouth. Except for Captain McCann of the Marines. It was like they were told when they got back to England. Except for oh, John McCann, who was the, the captain of the Marines. He... Pardon, Susan? I was just saying when the... Uh, the um... Say again, please, Susan. When the British ones came back to England, the government said, do not say anything, shut up and be quiet and just get on with life. And that's mm. why that was done about it, wasn't it? Oh, yeah, completely. Yeah. 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 Also, I've just... Uh, so that, that's why yeah. we are, we are uh, as children... Also, just... Go on. Yeah. Sorry, this is the day. Um, I've also put on a numerous, numerous um, Facebook pages I'm on uh, a piece about sort of um, um, VJ Day, and I put it on. I'm on Royal Air Force Salita uh, Singapore website, and I put it on there and saying that's from uh, Salita and Sing um, Changi and everything, and I've got a great response from people uh, about it. And um, I put it on two of my local, uh, three of my local um, Facebook pages, very well received. And, um, hearts and thumbs up and all the rest of it so i'm, I'm spreading the word as much as i can <laughs> well i'll jump in and say about spreading the word um the the other week we, we um at the last election we got a, a new um mp and a um, change of um, party that he stood for and he's he's been quite very proactive in in our area which is good um but he did put on something the other day for Eid, where he was, you know, wishing everybody in the Muslim community um, everything best. So I, I did add and say, yes, I'll join in with you in that. But please, what are you doing for VJ Day? Um, to which I sort of thought I was going, wasn't going to get any response. Well, I was a bit amazed when one of his um, team contacted me. Oh, I put on the, about the um, Commonwealth war graves that are in in our local churchyard, one of which is a FIPO. Um, and then, of course, my dad's there, so I go and put everything for my dad. Um, anyway, what he asked was that I met him and walked down the churchyard with him next Saturday, which is a bit sad, isn't it? Because, you know, I said, no, I'm sorry, I can't. But I am actually going to meet him a week on Monday, on the 17th. So he's going to get a bit of an ear bending because, <laughs> because we've now delayed a lot of the... Um, the VJ thing that's going to be VJ 75 plus one, as there's very little in Birmingham to commemorate any of these men, um, I'm going to hopefully um, get him to perhaps see about VJ 75 plus one in Birmingham and do something then. Because the sad thing is, I don't think the British Legion will want to repeat what they're doing next year. <laughs> Coastal Coast will be doing 
you know, their thing next year if we're out of this COVID thing. Um, I've also asked him to invite the local um, MP who I've known since I was a child um, to come with us. He lives around the corner from the churchyard. And I shall show them the Commonwealth war graves that are there. There's about five of them, plus my dad. Um, obviously, he, wasn't, he didn't die till 1990. And try and stir up some interest for next year so that when we're free from this, we can commemorate this properly. I mean, you might feel different. Mate. You may think, well, no, we've only got next Saturday to do it. No, but no, not no. I, I want, We've raised the interest. Let's keep it going. Um, because it, this is what has been wrong. You know, we have these things and then it all dies. Um, and can I just say that the, the, um, the news sheet I did, um, it, it sort of grew. I'm wearing my, where's, where's one of you that have had badges? Um, I'm wearing my Barfipo badge. I can't very well show you. My, my printer's running out of ink, so our Bar Fipo badge there, it does say Bar Fipo VJ75. We should have done Bar Fipo 75 plus one, but I lost out on the argument of that. But I've been absolutely fascinated with, with what people have um, supported me in this, this one that I've done and sent me things in about their dads. You know, there's um, all of you sitting there who have helped me with this. Five of you, sorry, Martin, I missed you out. Martin, your story is there as well, Martin, in, in Australia. Thank um, you. And I've learned so much about not just the people that we meet at our meetings, but the reason why they're there. And it's been fascinating because we look at everything in the big picture, don't we? And, and the reason they're there is these personal stories that we carry with us that, um, you know, you're interested in doing Kevin today if we're, we're going to say a little bit um yeah it's fascinating we, we we can't just look at the big picture of what happened it's everybody's individual stories because we carry we carry that with us as, as children of these people sorry I, I get a bit I get very emotional over it you know um, the other, good on you Barbara yeah. the other thing you want to remember you don't have to remember but it might be worth bearing in mind is why that keep your tongue or guard your tongue leaflet was issued. Now you really want to think about that. Because I, all I the POWs, find... all the POWs, I believe, got one for a very good reason. Perhaps they tore them up. That, that's, that's something you want to consider and read the wording of it. Don't yeah. talk to the press any more than you should now. But just think about it. All right. Well, my understanding was got, so, so it didn't jeopardise the war crimes trials. Number one, yeah. The other one was the fact that if you started blurting out what happened to you and people you knew, the next of kin of those people <clears throat> may not have been told what happened. That certainly happened with the Gunner 600 party. Those that died on Balalay, they did find out what happened to them. But the Royal Artillery for years stuck to the story they died on a hospital ship that went down on the 5th of March, 1943. But I mean, it didn't. There was no hospital ship. We know that. And it's it was all sparked off by a couple of the guys that came home from the rescue by the Americans from, of convoy HI-72, the Rakumaru, Kashidoki Maru. And two of those guys opened their mouths to the public and the press. And the army wanted to court martial them. And they were told by the army council, good try. If you'd have made it an order to keep your mouth shut, you could have court martialed them. You didn't, so you can't. And the army were very concerned that relatives were going to be fed false information or horrific information, and that would get back to the press. And as Martin said, jeopardize the war crimes trials jeopardize the POWs that were still in Japanese hands because we are looking at 1944. So there's still another good eight, nine months to go. So this is, in a way, why that notice was issued. And I know a lot of the fee posts thought, oh, oh, I've got to keep my mouth shut then. All right, we do that. They took it literally, bless them. Um, it's always, it's always, a, handy to just have a little bit of a dig as to why these things were issued you think well hold on this was important to the nation why should they keep their mouths closed 
but then you start thinking about it and oh, yeah perhaps it might have been a good idea but of course over the years the story has now come out or most of it has and it becomes let's say acceptable um but it's not so much of a shock mm. it's still it's well, the next of kin i mean even i find stuff reading the books i mean i was looking at one instance and i picked up um I always remember my dad telling me, and Martin knows this one, Mr. the friar there. Um, when he was in Tamuan on the 31st of December 1944, he told me that a drunken Japanese guard shot a prisoner. One fourteenth of an elephant, drunken Japanese officer shot a prisoner. Lieutenant Colonel Knight's adjutant published a memoir about him and Knights was at this camp saying he was in charge of Tamu and it was the new group 4HQ and he noticed that there was a Japanese major complete with jack boots which is always a sign of the Kemper tie major looking about taking no running interest in running of the camp at all which was run by a captain and he couldn't quite figure this out and this major was looking for this particular gentleman who he knew was going under the wire and actually he did kill him on the 31st of December 1944 the poor guy hadn't got under the wire that night lights out of sound that he was on his way back to his hut and the major shot him so still lots out there to learn but I don't know whether the family ever officially found out what happened to him yeah, not not until the not until the release of the documents. Um, That's right. Yeah. 2000, in two thousand eight. Yeah. yeah. It's strange though, isn't it? Because I mean, when you you look at the um, the newsletter, the news sheet that I've done, there are two in there um, where the death certificates, the cause of death, are wrong. The one is a chap buried yeah, in Chung yeah. Kai. She's talking now. Um, um, so, hi, Jan. Hi, yeah. <laughs> and the other one is the one that um, <laughs> Ken Coy's dad um, was actually involved in a war crime because oh, he, yes, he'd witnessed. Yes. So, there's yes. out of those few that I've got in my news sheet, we've got two incidents there where they were murdered, um, mm -hmm. but the Japanese covered it up in, the, in their death certificates. But one, uh, we, we know that, um, you know, the chap was brought to to that. And, you know, lots of these, it makes you wonder how many men died, but their, their true cause of death was never put on the death certificate. And the Japanese got away with that, really. Um, I don't know. It's, it's, you know, to me, it just comes across as strange. And did anybody realize that I'd actually unearthed a lot of that sounds awful. I'm after live FIPO. I discovered um, a live uh, another FIPO who's still alive, 99 years old, living in Scotland, um, called Buster, who's hoping to come to our Birmingham lunch set VJ 75 plus one next year. He's quite determined to come from Scotland. I'm fingers crossed. I'll say no more. Oh, yes. He would be so welcome to join us if he could do that journey. Yeah. Where and he's going to wear his. Um, is bar fipo badge with pride next saturday so you know good things come from passing yeah the, that's right he um, went to um taiwan and from taiwan yeah. to japan yeah i've got i've done some work on it barbara sorry i haven't got back to have you me. brilliant i've just had an email from christine broadhurst she's going to contact you to thank you for that extra information that you unearthed for her um oh. what she put in my my new sheet so she's really pleased uh, thank you Keith for that um, okay. yes but um, to find this Uncle Buster as she calls him was was fascinating and he and his brother were both um, prisoners yeah I've got, got round to his brother yet no. <laughs> but I'm going to have to when, when I get back up to Q I'll, I'll see if they've got uh, liberation yeah. questionnaires I think his brother would have not sure about um, Buster because he was liberated from um, Fukuoka 9B, my Arto. Sorry, my Arto. So, those liberation questionnaires for people liberated from Japan, it's pretty much hit and miss. Depends which way they came home, I think. Yeah. It's so interesting as well because the, the one of them, had, I think it was her dad, 
um, was working with some doctors that they were FIPOs, but I don't know if they'd actually were working in the Army Medical Corps, but um, uh, he worked with the one who asked the Japanese to give them the unpolished grains, you know, the rice, because um, oh, yes. he realised about the link with um, the uh, beriberi and uh, the um, unpolished grains of rice. So, you know, that was quite interesting. So after this chap had um, been um, uh, eventually left the army, which wasn't until in the 50s, because he was sent back out. Um, he was a non-commissioned um, officer, um, became commissioned. And the story is very interesting because his... Um, um, I don't know what you call it, but anyway, the, the Queen, the new Queen as she was then, actually hand-signed her um, thing for him to become a commissioned officer. When he came out of the army, he then trained to be a doctor, inspired by the FIPOs he'd worked with uh, while a prisoner of war, which I think is quite uh, good, and you know, particularly this thing about the uh, unpolished grains of rice. Mm. I think most of us don't even think about what rice we eat nowadays, but it made a lot of difference to the prisoners to have um, vitamin B included in the rice, and, and it reduced the incidence of beriberi out there. So, sorry, I'll shut up. <laughs> well, I say, um, when my yeah. father, when my father, uh, not father, my uncle died, on the official records it said. Um, polyapitamosis of the lack of vitamins mm -hmm. um, due to starvation <laughs> um, but some of the prisoners of war that came back my mother said uh, some of them said <clears throat> he was so weak they laid him on the, the rail track and ran one of the trucks over him but he was it didn't even need to tie him down because he was too weak to move oh. now nothing's been said about that you would have thought when they buried him, they said, hang on, the bones are all broken up, but nothing has been said. So was it just something they were, I won't say scaremongering or what have you, because you don't do that to relatives. No, or you don't. that a cover up? But the official one is that he died of starvation, really, lack of vitamins. So yeah. there's it's possibly it's another one there, isn't there? Mm. Sorry, yeah. brother. Sorry, that, so your father may be another one where the death certificate really hid his cause of death. You know, it's so, sorry to say that to you, but uh, you do wonder, don't you, you know, about some yeah. of these deaths? Yeah, it was my, yeah, it's my uncle, yeah. yeah. Your uncle, sorry. sorry. Yeah, that's right. In actual fact, that's one of the reasons why the hold your, guard your tongue notice was issued. Right. I'm amazed that somebody would have told your next of kin that. Yeah. Mm. How many more? Yeah. Even now, 75 years afterwards, I'm just amazed that somebody would do that. Mm. You know, my mm. uh, Mike Nellis, um, who some of you might remember from conferences, his father used to go around because he was a regimental quartermaster sergeant. And he would say, yes, I was with your son when he died. He was surrounded by friends. He was in hospital. You know, never really told them part of the truth, but not the full truth. Because you, know, you, can see, you look at all the records and everything. I mean, I've got a, a photograph of the page where my uncle is on from the National Archives. And mm -hmm. um, most of them are very, very lack of vitamins and all the rest of it. Um, surely not all of them were through all those dates. Uh, nothing's been uh, said about the ill treatment that they died from. If it's um, the document that at the top left hand corner is headed JH and a number, Right, that's the report the Japanese sent to the International Red Cross. Yeah, that's not the report that the British medics were keeping. They actually logged the true date of death. I mean, I've got one page I saw. I thought, how many men have died of indigestion? You know, it's a complete page. I think no, and you go and start de delving deeper, and that wasn't indigestion. Was it? enteritis it was dysentery it was you know various things um the one that i thought was absolutely ridiculous was regarding a report sent and it had some americans on it and the japanese had actually written all right against his death executed and underneath but don't state this as cause of death and they had left it there so of course that goes over <laughs> 
Yeah. That goes over to the Allied powers. Think, oh, okay. We know what we know what happened now. That's that's going to be a war crime. But you know, you do. Yeah, yeah, but come back to what you were saying, Keith, about not talking. The men not talking when they came back from uh, the the prisoner war camps. There is uh, actually an account of a man who was in my father's camp, uh, Eric Dis. He unfortunately mm -hmm. died just after the declaration of uh, the end of the war. Uh, and a good friend of his didn't wait at least a few months after he got home just to make sure that his parents knew that he had died officially before he actually wrote to them. Yeah, it's, it's, it's trying to try, if you can, and... You can never try and put yourself in somebody else's place um, because you, you you know i I've, I've lost my both my parents yes but i've not that's that's the amount of my trauma but in those circumstances it's very very difficult to go back 75 years and think what would i have done what would i have done um and yes, it must be terribly difficult for people that come home and, and um, knowing full well how people died, but not saying anything until you say the time was right. An interesting. When the men came home after the war they, and they formed the uh, FIBO Association, uh, my father joined that obviously, and um, I, th I thought that helped him quite significantly because he was then able to talk to men who had been through the same experience as him yeah so i think he really benefited from that no i think i think that helped a lot i mean my father stayed in the army after the war until 1951 but he never joined any fipo associations and the only time i can remember this is a tape of uh, general percival um talking at the fipo conference in 1954 um, which um, I've just had, I've had lots of stuff given to me by um, relatives of a FIPO. Um, there's also, there's two more tapes here of him being interviewed on the radio. Um, he himself was about 70 at the time. And so, you know, I, I get the feeling that the interviewer leads him on, but General Percival in this one, um, present at that, there was um, Patrick Toosey, the Bishop of Birmingham, Leonard Wilson, and other names which I want to listen to again and get you lot to perhaps help me identify who the who they were that were at this conference. Um, it's shorter than I'd hoped it's going to be, but basically all that uh, General Percival says to the men of the FIPO Association um, is that the Japanese should pay compensation um, to them. I was hoping he was going to say something a bit more, but um, that's what that's what the main part of his. Um, his speech to the FIPO associations there. The British, the British uh, government signed any chance of compensation away at the San Francisco conference. Yeah. Uh, they the other signed, they signed, signed it away. Yeah. But so it's, it's interesting to actually hear Percival's voice, you know, mm. um, nine years after the end of the war. Oh, my, the, my father met him. Um, and there was going to be a, was a conference or a dinner. Mm -hmm. And he said, oh, are you going to attend the dinner, sir? And Percival turned around to him and said, Sergeant Major, the British Army doesn't like losers. So That's no. part of our problem with our, getting our FIPO story out, isn't it? I mean, this is basically uh, is our problem. Um, to mm. have surrendered, um, their battles then started afresh, didn't they? Their battles oh, yeah. To yeah. Um, their battle was a different battle. Forgotten is the battles that they put in in defence of places like Hong Kong and Singapore and, and all of those areas and Java. Those are forgotten. You know, they, they concentrate on the, um, uh, the forgotten army. Um, I, I don't think there's any public understanding of the battle that these men then faced once they'd been captured. Uh, they didn't realise it to start with, but for most of them, the battle was just to survive from day yeah. to day, mm. you know. I mean, for my dad, it was keeping the... He was fond, of, very fond, very close to his mother, and he was looking forward to seeing her again. Um, all his letters home, you know, the cards that eventually arrived, um, are saying, looking forward to seeing you. And he didn't, never knew until he got home and walked through the door of his own home that she had died in 1943. 
if he'd known, maybe he wouldn't have fought so much to survive no, and come home. that's it. I don't know. Yeah. And you would have I mean, been lucky because I wouldn't have know, been coming on at you today. <laughs> I mean, some some FIPOs, there's, there's certainly one I've read an account where um, I believe he was with the 135th anti-tank. And when they were liberated on the ship home, he found out the day they sailed from Liverpool, they'd, been, they'd, been, they'd sailed in the middle of an air raid, his wife, children, parents, children, children yours, were all wiped out. Ah. Only just took one look at that. And the quote from somebody who was, somebody who was writing this, nobody stopped him going over the side, unquote. Yeah. Yeah, it's so sad. In actual fact, Maybe. I think Tony, Tony Bannon was saying years ago, there was a, I think a member of the Royal Scots, they'd never returned to the UK after he was released. Even though he was a British citizen, he'd never returned. So whether he had nothing to come back to, I don't know. Yeah. Well, they had the same thing just come up recently. At one of the Exeter ABs, um, he, he got home, went to his home, went to his last known address, which had been wiped out in the London air raids. Um, he found a local pub uh, and said, you know, what happened here? Everybody on that street was wiped out. Uh, so he just packed his bags and went back to Australia. And he, he started working down in Fremantle, where he'd been for the last three weeks. Uh, when Maidstone came in for her uh, paying off thing. Mm. So, you know, the, the, uh, the shock of coming back to everything is just, well, okay, let me go back. I, I'll go back to Australia. Where, yeah. where I, I, mm. And back to the new that he just met on the way home. So no. the, it's by no means uh, an isolated story. No, no, I'm, I'm, you know, don't, no get, don't get me wrong, Tom, I don't think it is for a minute. It's just one that I've come across. I mean, a amu slightly amusing one was now my ex, my late father-in-law was in the Royal Marines. We don't know much about his service because really I don't think it, 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 my ex-wife has followed up on it. But evidently, he was given compassionate leave to go home because his parents ran a pub in the East End. So he went home. Yeah. Area was flattened. And he could hear music. And it would appear that his parents were okay. The brewery wouldn't let them sell the beer. So the street party. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, it's just, just no one. Problem. Yeah. I'll no, drink no. to that. Yeah. Just, just one instance, instance. But when I was a kid, you know, there was, um, I used to walk to school past this pub. And I said to my mum one day, mum, why is that pub wrecked? It looks like there's a fire. She said, yes, that was, that was hit during the war by a V1 rocket. Uh, no, nobody survived it. So, yeah. It's all gone quiet. It's early, kid. You mentioned... Uh... You mentioned, uh, Keith, you mentioned Fukuoko 9B. Yes. Uh, the, uh, the roles are on, the roles, the roles are on Mantle's website. Yep. Yep. The full, full is, oh, you've got them. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, I must the admit expert. that I print those off and they wind up in the building so that You've actually got a complete list of the Japanese camps. Yep. All those that Ro Roger was able to to get lists for. There may be some some still at queue, but the trouble is, if they say um, you look for a particular guy, it's Tokyo Camp Roll. Yes, it's a roll that everybody that was in all the Tokyo camps, not necessarily broken down by camp, which is a bit of a nuisance. But uh, you make the best of what you got. Uh, does that include the secret camps? I would have to look. You think about Orfuna? Yeah. Yeah, I thought you might be. I'll have a look. There is a, there is a, a list on uh, Mantle's website, no Orfuna. <coughs> yeah, I don't, I'd have to have a look on that one. So have you got, have I, you got I have printed off a list now? of that, uh, of Orfuna. Have you got my father's camp six, Keith? I'll have a look for you. What was it? Which one? 
Six. Fukuoka. Fukuoka six. Mm. Hold on a second, just remove ears. Tom Morton, I, I noticed. I think it's uh, there, that most, the, most of them were. The passenger lists of the HMS Implacable. Notice there's quite a few men from the exit are on there. I don't no, they were from the Exeter that was at the Battle of the River Plate. And a lot of them when they came home, the ship went into refit and they moved on to other ships. Um Jim London was on the implacable. Uh it, it was at the Battle of the River Plate. Uh came home for the refit. He went on to Implacable and he met his old shipmates on Implacable as he picked as they picked them up after the after they came out of the camps. And say so two hundred of the Exeter two hundred of the lads from Exeter from Makasa went up to Japan. A hundred worked on the uh, Nagasaki two B and uh, another hundred worked in the uh, Arso coal mines. twenty six B. So, you know, the as they came out of there a lot of them came home on the implacable. I'm just saying that the implacable did two or three journeys out, out of Okinawa to Australia and to um, Canada to, to get the lads home. Mm. Um, she did quite a few, so, but they, they stripped her of all the uh, aircraft so that they could use all the hangars as berths. Mm. That's right. Which was 100% improvement on what they've been suffering over the last three years. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I think the aircraft went over the side, didn't they? Because the Americans didn't want them back. Yeah. <laughs> Probably. Yeah. Better than 1942 when there were still in packing cases on the dock side. Oh, yeah. Dear me. Yes, uh, my uncle was in the uh, Royal Northumberland Fusiliers. And, uh, quite a few of them got shipped over to Japan. And uh, there's quite a few of them on the HMS and Plugable as well. Now, my father was attached to the Northumberland Fusiliers, and so was Louise's father. Yeah. They were together. Yeah. Yeah. My dad was with the Ninth Coast, um, captured Singapore, worked on the railway liberated from Tackley camp, which was um, an airfield camp. They were building an airfield for the Japanese that evidently the Japanese never used, but the, R the RAF did. Um, and he came home on the Chitral, 28th of October, 1945. My dad was sent out to uh, Singapore for a holiday by um, Churchill after working uh, in the Blitz uh, on the docks, um, particularly in Bristol where it was Ooh. quite uh, yeah. bad during the, the blitz um so uh, they sent them out because they said that uh, singapore was impenetrable um so he was captured on the 15th of february as we all know um and he was sent out to saigon maybe he was lucky to go out there i don't know carol cooper once described it to me as um the, the holiday camp um but um yeah he was sent out to saigon in April so he, he moved quite early and he was there apart from one short stint where he was sent to build an airfield in Pahumi or Fumi. Um, he was um, freed on the uh, 12th of September, flown to Rangoon and uh, came home via that uh, trip landing um, in Liverpool at the pier head on the Orduna on which um, Bill Franklin came back and I know Martin Purcell who Many of you will know his dad was also on that um, ship. So that was my dad's short story. The holiday camp. The holiday thing, camp. Actually, actually never came, it was, was never Carol Cooper's phrase. That was um, an ex Saigon Ernie Goff. Called, yeah. yes. Ernie Goff, I think you said to Ernie me. Goff, yeah. Said it to, yeah. Because he was. Must have been dad. thinking of Batlins. Yeah. <laughs> 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 And, and, and the go-downs where Dad spent most of his time working in Saigon are still there, but the actual site of where the men were, were kept, um, that's all gone and been cleared. But when you look across from the um, dockland there, because, you know, they were all, you know, prisoners should escape if possible. 
um, although it's all been altered now, there was just dense jungle across the other side of the river. We, George and I you know, took a boat trip all along there. There was no way those men could have escaped. You know, mm -hmm. They were lucky that they were helped a bit by the French, um, who, who did pass food to them perhaps when they could. But um, no, it, there was no way they could have escaped. They stood, stood out like sore thumbs anyway in that population. So. Mm. I wonder whether it would be worthwhile writing to the Vietnamese embassy and saying, can you possibly tell me where the camps were? Yeah, well, th there have been, and the only that we just mentioned, he actually um, was allowed uh, ad admission into where the go-downs were yeah. when he went to Frank Clark, who a lot of you will probably know as well, um, when he took Ernie out with him um, out to Saigon. But when, when we went out there, nobody even remembered World War Two. They obviously no. they, they just think about the American war. Yeah, and they're they're, just getting over they got that, nothing to add. Nothing to add no. to the story that I was looking for. But that's life. Mm. Yeah, my uncle, he was um, a royal engineer, um, sent out um, he was then in Joseph Berry was a sapper. Um and he was um, captured at Changi, or imprisoned in Changi, mm. and then transferred. I'm not too sure if he was put on a train or or marched up there. But he um, he died at. Um, he worked on the the actual bridge, being a royal engineer. Obviously, had the skills and everything. Um, and he he died. On the 19th of August, 1943, he was 30 years old. Um, my father went out to see his grave, his, his brother's grave, in the 60s. Took him three days um, to travel from Bangkok by boat, um, bus, and all the rest of it. I went in, uh, I think it was 1997, and it took us three hours by hotel taxi. Mm. We had a um, we had the driver, translator, um, and a guard with us. Don't know why we needed a guard, but <laughs> maybe I don't know. Maybe that was stop me from doing anything. But um, the graves were fantastically looked after. The chap, the groundsman was really really good i knew the number and everything but he insisted on looking at the book and showing me the whole register of the books and everything and i gave him a a, a, a tip whatever just to, as a thank you for the um for looking after the place so nice and he was so grateful and i think if people go out there i think to any of the graves on uh, cemeteries, I think they should consider the groundsman and give them a tip, donation, or whatever, just as a small thank you. Um, going back to the Facebook thing, I did set one of the Facebook ones, my local one. Um, he, it, one of the chaps that replied to me was the editor of our local uh, paper. We're only a small market town, but it is an editor thing. And he said, oh, we're not doing celebrations in August. Um, if we can, we'll be doing it in September when it was officially signed. So I did say to him <laughs> that the, the majority were released on the 15th of August. Mm. So, um, but anyway, and I think there are a lot of them saying they're going to have um, – VJ Day and VE Day for next year, September, May or September, and they're going to do it and uh, call it 75 plus one. Uh, so. For VJ 70, our, our group um, did this. This is the Missouri, um, because we actually celebrate more the 2nd of September and the signing, um, but uh, they managed to do this really quite amazing um, medallion for the VJ70 for the signing, which was very nice in the posh Yes, box. apparently the English do the, the um, um, August and the Americans do the September more. The, the, FIPO, the FIPO voted to, um, to go for the 15th. They asked for it to be 
FIPO day, I understand, mm -hmm. yeah, which is why we go for that. Yeah. Um, but the more I learn, um, and more from Keith, um, there were different surrenders. There wasn't just one surrender, was there? So, um, well, no, yeah. interestingly enough, I mean, it was decreed thou shalt not accept any surrenders before MacArthur signed on the 2nd of September. Mm. Bill Slim actually took the surrender of Rangoon in Burma sometime before then. That was the first, if you like, surrender. Right. Because you, you, was, you told us as well that um, Singapore didn't surrender for, was it two weeks? Uh, which um, gave the Japanese time to destroy a lot of evidence. Well, no, they 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 laid down their arms on the fifteenth of September, fifteenth, sixteenth, so fifteenth, sixteenth of August. Mm. But the British were forbidden by the Americans to go into Singapore before the second of September, before the surrender right. was signed. The okay. fleet that went into Hong Kong disobeyed that order. They arrived on the thirtieth of August take the surrender there. I think they were more concerned about the Chinese than anything else. Um, but yeah, the, the first surrender I think that was ever signed was the one in Rangoon. Can't believe that. Mm -hmm. Who said that? <laughs> Tom. Yeah. Mm. It, it is um, confusing with the, um, the variation in uh, what we interpret well, as. Yeah. When do Australians uh, commemorate VP, doesn't, isn't it? Victory in the Pacific Day. Is that right, Martin? Um, I'm actually not uh, aware, actually, because um, I know that the uh, second, fourth machine gun battalion do VJ Day here in Perth, but oh, right. um, on the eastern co east coast, I'm, I'm not really sure. I don't. I actually don't know. Oh, okay. The Australians were already um, invading Balikpapan in, in, on the Borneo side at the time, so they, they would have accepted the surrender a long time before then, before even Rangoon. Really? Why is you? Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. Thinking about it, you could be right, Tom, because... The, 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 the Australian. Yeah, because the Australians fortunately got there when they did because the camp at Kuching was... Um, Gonna follow, gonna follow yep. the same route as Sandakar. Already, already, because the Australian medical reports say they, they were already. Sorry, mate, you're breaking up. Who are you? <laughs> the, the, the Australians were because the, the Australians had three or four cruisers up there um, to invade Balikpapan to retain the oil fields um, and as soon as the oil fields were gone then, then the Japanese were finished um, but they did it without thinking about all the other camps that were on Borneo and because they, they had, the instructions were as soon as your the enemy comes anywhere near your camp kill all the prisoners Mm. Or get rid of all the prisoners. So they're, they're, they're taking a, a big risk. I mean, most of the, from what I've read, most of the Borneo camps were lined up to start executing prisoners on the fifteenth of August. Oh, yeah, yeah. Kuching, they were they were building another camp oh, seventeen yeah. miles away. Oh yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, um, they were, and they were going to march the civilians and POWs from Kuching to this other camp and the Australians arrived first before that, could take before that could ever take place and their medical team said that had that have taken place there would have been very few survivors they were in such a bad way so yeah what you're, what you're saying is right the camps were going to be yeah. exterminated mm. well I'm going to have to sign off everybody because it's, uh, yeah. it's dinner time it, over it's here it's dinner now. time yeah <laughs> 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 it's okay, not, Martin, not really more like you guys. <laughs> we will be so, it, Martin. <laughs> so yeah, um, I hope I hope you all your um, BJ uh, commemorations go well at the weekend. Yeah, fingers and, uh, crossed. No doubt we'll uh, we'll catch up and talk about it soon. Yep. Okay. Bye, okay. Martin. Bye, okay. Bye, bye. Cheers, Martin. Cheers. Bye, bye. Cheers. Bye. -bye.
Okay, I'll uh, just stop the recording. Uh, thank you, everybody, for being here today.